So, if you can start by just saying and spelling your name for us. Khalif Matthew, K-A-L-I-F-M-A-T-H-I-E-U. Today is Friday, May 25th, 2018, and we are at Pig Pounder Brewery in Greensboro, North Carolina. I am Richard Cox, talking today with Khalif Matthew, head brewer as part of the Well-Crafted NC Project. So if we can start, if you can tell us a little bit about yourself. Well, where to begin? Um, I assume we're going to talk about beer a whole lot today, so I'll take this opportunity to not talk about beer, perhaps. I don't know. Mm -hmm. um, I was born in Haiti. My parents were living overseas there for about 10 years, and, uh, but I didn't grow up there. Grew up in central Illinois and went to college at Alma College in Michigan and uh, majored in English and political science. And that's kind of where I sort of hit some stumbling blocks. Um, went to work in D.C. for a little while doing some grant writing. It wasn't super fun. So I joined the Peace Corps instead. Went to China for a couple of years and taught English. That's where I met my wife. Um, moved back to the States. And that's kind of where I found my footing. Um, got in with a college friend of mine brewing beer at a brewery in Michigan. And that's... That's where I sort of found my passion and found my way. Okay, well that leads into how did you first become interested in the brewing industry? Right, so when I was in Peace Corps, I decided that um, paper pushing and teaching and stuff was all right, but not great. I felt like I needed to find something to do where I was producing a physical product. Um, rather than some amorphous measurement of achievement. So I was looking around at maybe going to the Bach and Shale oil fields or maybe Texas or something like that and being a rig hand or starting something in that direction. And that's when uh, my college friend Chris Noel slash fraternity brother uh, was looking to bring on some assistant brewers and I kind of jumped on that opportunity as, hey, you could do this for 10 bucks an hour. It's just scrubbing buckets, but you'll learn the trade. And I got real excited at the opportunity and jumped on board. And so my passion for brewing kind of happened as the lowest of the lowest levels in a craft brewery, just scrubbing the floors and doing some real basic stuff but learning how to make beer, and it just kind of snowballed from there. Awesome. So since you moved from Michigan to North Carolina, how would you compare the, the beer scene in both states? Honestly? Yeah. Um, the beer scene changes by geography almost uh, slower than it changes by time frame. So I was brewing, I started in 2012, um, and in 2016 moved down to North Carolina. So 2012 to 2016 was a very different phase of life, if you were to say, in craft beer in general, in the country. Um, if you were here in North Carolina in 2013 versus now, it's a different world versus up in Michigan, kind of the same story. Right. Um, there were 28 or so breweries in the Grand Rapids area that you could drive to in 40 minutes or so. Um, so there's quite a bit of diversity already there. Some big names that you could go visit, Bells, Founders, um, New Holland was just coming up as a huge regional uh, producer. And so you have these big volume guys, but also lots of very small uh, pub shops, even uh, multiple places that would be just making beer on a 10 gallon system on the stove where they would also cook food in sort of a sandwich pub environment. Um, so you'd have the full gamut, but um, I would say it's simply more advanced down here in, in North Carolina than where it was when I was up in Michigan, but that's probably simply because it was 2013, 14, 15, 16, not 2017, 2018, 
where you have just this explosion of new beers and new breweries. Sure. Okay. So bouncing on the Pig Pounder, um, how did the brewery arrive at the name Pig Pounder? Pig Pounder comes from our owner, Marty Cotis, uh, purchasing the last Daryl's restaurant on High Point Road, Gate City Boulevard now, um, a number of years back. And Daryl's had a beer brewed contract for them back in 1988 called the Pig Pounder. And it was served in a 16 ounce bottle, um, hence the pounder, pints a pound. Um, and the pig obviously is a reference to the Daryl's brand and their barbecue and all that. And so he had the IP for beer, a wonderful label, and jumped off of that to set it up as sort of the structure for the brewery as the icon that over a couple of years, believe it or not, the bobblehead of the tap handle didn't come along until 2015, 2016. Um, the brewery opened in 2014. So it was actually a little bit down the road that we arrived at the point where the bobblehead is sort of our, our figure. Did that original beer move to the brewery too? So that is sort of a um, shelved, interesting research project for me to find the original recipe for that beer so that we can rebrew it. I think it would be really exciting because it's so different from what we normally do here. Um, you could call Pig Pounder an ale house. We only make ale. We don't brew lager um, yet. And I think it would be wonderful if our first lager to be produced at this facility is the original recipe for yeah. the Pig Pounder in 1988. But it's because of course that wasn't a light American lager recipe. <laughs> Nobody was drinking anything else back then. Right. So if someone were unaware of Pig Pounder, how would you describe the brewery to people who've never been here and didn't know what you do? So we are a little bit off the beaten path, cool, funky, but also conventional place that tries to offer a good spread of different things. So we have currently 12 different beers of our own that are on tap, anything from light to dark to fruit to uh, sour and we're also running a bourbon barrel aging program so that's something to look forward to in the winter months coming up um, and it really is of course i talk about the beer it's really about the beer and that's that's sort of the focal point but of course if you've got a group of friends and you want to head out to this that and the other place don't feel like you're excluded we also have a good offering of North Carolina wine and California wine and um, local ciders from Bull City and other places. We always like to try to mix it up because not every day, even as a brewer, do you want to have a beer. Um, and so you touched on this already a little bit just briefly, but most breweries in Greensboro are clustered downtown. So can you talk a little bit about your unique location and how that has affected your business model and maybe your customer base? Sure. Um, so we're located in what's called now Midtown, um, which is this corridor of Battleground Avenue coming out of downtown and then shooting up towards um, kind of across. Uh, you can reach Friendly Center, and then if you go north, then it's mostly housing for a general bit, but there's also quite a bit of shops and locations just within say a mile here um, that starts where we are and runs up north um, for at least a mile of various different shops and locations that you can go to since Battleground is such a thoroughfare. And that sets the area apart right there from downtown where if you're on, as you're saying downtown, well almost you could say South Elm Street specifically. There's a, there's a nice, tight little neighborhood there where everything is walkable. Right. And so you can get around to this, that, and the other um, hole-in-the-wall type place. So you can find some food here, you can find some beer there, you can find some shops and uh, browsing over here. Um, you have all these different things that you can 
uh, discover and interact with and find, and it's close enough to not worry about um, how you're going to get there. And that is something that Midtown is in the process of becoming, where you can get around to this, that, and the other place uh, without worrying too much about how you're going to get there. It's not quite there yet, though, mm -hmm. and so that informs quite a bit of the business model as well. Um, being outside of downtown and being further away from, say, a restaurant or something like that next door, you kind of need to structure yourself to offer uh, a little bit more of a destination rather than a piece of the puzzle. Okay. So when you first came to Pig Pounder in 2017, what were your first impressions? Uh, diamond in the rough, to be gentle. <laughs> Pig Pounder was part of a family of restaurants with Marty Cotis uh, starting his restaurateur program to try to, I don't want to speak for him, but he's very passionate about good food, good beverages, high culture, and he wanted to bring those things here to Greensboro. And to execute that vision, he started up Marshall Free House, English style pub across the street from Pig Pounder this brewery as well um, following along later on uh, burger warfare which is still across the street and they're open but the marshall freehouse never quite made it um, and then that was retooled in 2017 to the traveled farmer uh, which is a very um, farm to table type setup which also didn't quite find its stride here in greensboro what most folks who went there say is that it was all excellent but the price point just didn't quite make sense so maybe it was a factor of how many super high-end um, I don't want to say millennial but super high-end restaurant locations can can Greensboro support in 2014 2015 2016 um, and it was just a challenge of that and Pig Pounder was sort of a part of that vision where it was set up to brew exclusively English style beer to pair with the English style pub across the street, Cascale all day, and a wide variety of different kinds of modern English beer. Um, so nothing funky or weird or uh, experimental at all. Um, and that also struck me as a little strange for when I came to the brewery in 2017, I was scratching my head. It's 2017, not 2014. Um, in 2014, maybe you could get by brewing classic styles of a specific origin, and that's it. But in 2017, it's a very different environment where you have more breweries and a lot more craft beer being consumed. So you have more people in North Carolina that are craft brewery customers, so to speak. Um, and so you have a very different uh, you have a very different dynamic of what's going on around you. So you gotta kind of take that um, and inform how you structure yourself. So when I came into the brewery, it was I don't want to say mothballed, but close. There were a couple placeholder folks in positions to keep brewing the beer because Sam Rose, the original head brewer who started the project in 2014, had moved on to Funky Buddha in Florida, and uh, that left the brewery without any strong beer leadership, and the restaurant group was very much tied up in what was happening with the Marshall Freehouse, and then converting that into the Traveled Farmer, and so you had a lot of folks who had an opportunity to get involved, distracted by other projects, and Pig Pounder, simple as it was, could just brew some boar brown and some extra special and could get by and could keep serving the restaurants and keeping everybody um, satisfied with enough beer, and that was enough for the project through 2016. But I was brought on as part of a team of people in 2017 so it was myself, Cassie Winfrey, as a sales and tap room, 
and uh, Jake Murphy as our general manager who actually got borrowed from the movie theater across the street, Red Cinemas, um, to really start giving Pig Pounder some focus and some, some drive. And I, I, one thing I know is you're just talking about you indirectly address like the speed of change in the industry too because you're comparing 2014 to 27 so that's only like three years but we're talking about complete changes in what the businesses are doing breweries for example sure absolutely um in 2014 you could say here in greensboro you had natty greens downtown with their restaurant and pub which is kind of the original model of a craft brewery uh, what people used to call a microbrewery and um, they offered your standard fare of American beers we have a pale ale we have an IPA uh, we have an amber these kinds of things that were new and interesting um, when craft beer was just getting started and if you offer that together with a good restaurant setup, then you have a pretty respectable model and you can basically be a uh, grassroots type restaurant that also happens to brew their own beer um, as almost a side item. But that model, um, which I would say probably got started back in the 1980s when the very first micro breweries started opening right. um, with the nationwide legal environment. Um, that starts changing when you start uh, opening up craft to the point where you have waves of people excited and interested to try this whole new beer thing. Um, and so what happens is some breweries that are well positioned and figure out their game plan scale their volume production to take a 10 gallon stovetop system in, you know, let's say 2006, and by 2016 they're brewing on a 40 barrel system and they're cranking out 25,000 barrels a year. Um, and that's a very methodical step by step process that happens. Um, other, the other aspect in addition to that of, okay, so you have an established brand and you can figure out your growth plan and you execute that. What also happens is um, you get lots of new places starting at that 10 gallon system or maybe 10 barrel system, something in that uh, neighborhood volume range. And that also provides a whole different dynamic where okay now you have a whole bunch of different opportunities so an aspect of the craft beer taking off i'd like to try some new things with with interesting and bold flavor now you can get a wider variety of that and the demand is still there and the passion is still there to grow more so you get more and more and more locally focused breweries that are excited to sell beer um, directly to their consumers. They're not worried about scaling up to uh, brew 20,000 barrels a year or something like that. They're interested in serving a neighborhood um, a unique and interesting and exciting product. So when you got here, what changes did you initiate to better reflect your brewing approach, interests, or philosophy? Kind of three questions. Okay. Um, approach, interest, and philosophy. Well, so the beer informs the business, and the business informs the beer is kind of what we've been teasing around here mm -hmm. all morning. Um, originally, the business was set up to be a volume producer of English style beers that were of very high quality. In 2016, the Boar Brown took home the World Beer Cup for best English brown ale. Um, so the execution was very much there. The passion was very much there. Um, but the strategy to make that make sense as a business didn't quite make a whole lot of uh, sense at that point. 
partially because of the stumbling blocks of losing the head brewer and then not really having a whole lot of time and attention paid to the business. It was, let's stabilize for a while. And then I was brought in as part of this other team. And so myself being sort of the beer expert, um, the biggest business shift that Pig Pounder needed to make from my perspective, and I'm not a big business guy, mm -hmm. um, but the, the general understanding was, in addition to myself, everybody else who came on board, was that Pig Pounder is too small to try to do a wholesale volume production. So just make three or four beers and make a lot of it and sell it as far reaching as you can get. Um, that business model just doesn't quite work because we brew on a seven barrel system and we have four seven barrel fermenters, so single batch fermenters, and two 14 barrel fermenters. Um, if you even want to start talking about wholesale volume production, you need to be brewing, if you have a seven barrel brew house, you need to have 20 barrel fermenters. Um, and you need to turn that brew house three, four times to fill each fermenter. And you need to be doing that three times a week. Um, so the brewery was not constructed for volume. The brewery was constructed for variety. Single, single batch fermenters to brew different things. Mm -hmm. um, so the structure provided makes sense to be a locally focused uh, brewery that's excited about retail rather than wholesale. Um, so it's all about having the brewery itself be the business and customers come visit you rather than simply selling kegs of beer to restaurants. Um, and so with that in mind, the brewing philosophy needed to step out of only four styles of English beer and move more towards um, variety and also some experimental stuff and, um, and some basic sessionable beer so you have a wide spread of offerings that is continuously changing because if you want to focus on being uh, more retail, one of the biggest drives is to have a variety of things that's always developing. So if you come by in June and then you come by again in July, there are different beers you can try. And that's a big part of the brewing philosophy kind of following hand in hand with uh, what the business model should look like. So that was very exciting to me because that's what I always wanted to do was more variety and more interesting stuff and more funky things. Um, because yes, I'm excited about a good Kolsch. Yes, I enjoy a good Blondale. In fact, I drink one almost every day. But I'm also very much interested on the um, production side of trying new things and using unconventional ingredients um, and brewing different kinds of styles depending on the season and so on. And so that was the primary shift there as far as what beer Pig Pounder makes um, that came out of mostly myself is more variety, more different things. And so we came from in 2017, myself just finding my footing and rebalancing what was already going on. Now in 2018, we've grown our spread of different styles of beer from, there would always be five, four all year and one for each season. So from five beers on tap uh, at any one time, all the way up to 12 right now. Um, and that's something that we want to continue growing. So, um, which build, actually is building on what you're saying about the business is that the brewery is undergoing a lot of renovation and expansion of late, including new spaces and a pavilion. So what all is going on and what are your goals? With all the well, so I don't know if the camera shows everything, but this tap room was built out almost like my impression when I walk in is, okay, I'm coming by a wine bar to taste and then purchase some bottles to bring to dinner. Um, that's the impression that I get from this tap room at, uh, 
here at the brewery, where the production facility is behind here. We have our tap faucets. Um, we've got space for about 15 people to sit at the bar, and you get 20 in here, and it doesn't fit anymore. It's that small. Um, so to, again, bring that pig pounder should be its own identity. It should be a fun place to hang out. It should be a place to go. Um, to inform that, basically, we need more space. And so to work on it, the simple project, the small project, is to have a patio for outdoor seating. And that's currently getting a pergola put over um, for a little bit of shading to improve that out there. And that provides a whole bunch of space. I think seating out there is something around 30 or 40. And then next door is the big project at, uh, so our address here is 1107 Gricade. At 1111, we're installing a second bar with lots of seating and um, picnic table type setups and maybe a lounge area with some couches and ping pong and foosball and lots of cornhole and things like that. that is a much larger space that's almost the size of the production facility and this bar combined um, just for uh, space to hang out in. And so that's kind of, again, part of the vision of making Pig Pounder a fun place to go and experience new things and try new beers and, and have some fun. So what is it like to work in the craft brewing industry today? Versus over your career. <laughs> um, right, versus in 2012, well. Um, Which you did touch on a little bit about right, Michigan. Right, a little bit. I would say that the brewing scene has elevated quite a bit in this amount of time. Because imagine I started in 2012. OK, how many, how many other brewers started brewing in 2012? OK, that was six years ago. Now myself and all those folks have six years of production experience or what have you. Something, doing something in the brewery or doing all of the things in the brewery, which happens a lot when it's a small place. Um, so I would say a huge facet of that is simply getting over the um, novelty of what a craft brewery is and what it is like to work there and what you're tackling every day and getting to the point where, okay, we've done this before. We kind of see what's going on. And especially is the case, more often than not, certainly my case, but others as well, you'll spend time at multiple breweries. So I was at one brewery for two years and then another for two more years, and now I've been here at Pig Pounder for about a year and a half. So three breweries almost even spread in experience. And these all have very different dynamics. One was mostly focused on retail, but they s serviced huge crowds um, as a vacation destination spot. Um, so the variety of beer was just not there. It was volume, but at retail. Um, and that was on a 10 barrel brew house. So that's a certain kind of brewing and that's a certain kind of uh, skill set as it were of managing yeast of managing ingredients things like that um, then moving over to another brewery that was in the scaling process of moving itself towards 20,000 barrels a year on a 40 barrel brew house it was a team of maybe 12 full-time people every day in production to make the beer um, all the way down to the warehouse. And so if you're one person in that 12 person team, you're usually doing one thing every day. So that provides you an opportunity to get really good at that area, but you start to lose focus on the bigger picture simply because you're not involved. Um, so it can become very narrowing. And that wasn't quite where I found my passion. Some folks certainly did and you could operate a centrifuge 
every day and still feel like you're you're adding more value you're doing new things like you're you're growing your understanding of that aspect of the business and and you can continue to get even tighter on that specific item um, and folks like that definitely will find their place much better at a larger brewery because you can afford to focus more um, but for me it was uh, more interesting to take a holistic approach and pull different aspects together both from the business side as well as making beer side um, to kind of get a better understanding and a better utilization of, of how it all fits together. Something that I've discovered now uh, here at Pig Pounder with such a small scale setup where we have myself, um, another full-time brewer, Genesis, and then our manager who we see twice a week maybe, and Cassie on tap room, and then four, four or five bartenders, and that's the whole team. Um, you end up being involved in all of the different steps of the process. And it is, I hate to say it, but it's very easy to get distracted from making beer and just doing small business stuff instead. Because you've got all these different moving parts and different people and different places and phone calls to make and, and things to order. and So it can become very distracting to the point where uh, you lose focus on what's actually happening with brewing the beer. Um, so that's been a little bit of a push-pull relationship for myself of rediscovering how to design, develop, produce new styles of beer at the, at the same time as keeping the walls from coming down around you uh, just in normal operation. So what are some of the other challenges you sort of face on a day-to-day -day basis as the head brewer? Oh geez, well, um, there's a CO2 leak across the street at Burger Warfare. Can you please come down and fix it? Sure. Or um, that was just two days ago. Yeah. Or there's a, okay, we need to go take a look at what sort of um, draft line system we're going to install in the new Daryls out on Cone Boulevard. Um, or it doesn't really stop. It just kind of keeps happening over and over. Like there's a lot of stuff happening almost every day. Um, just yesterday we had a fun event with the delivery driver who we just brought on um, to drive beer around to all of our restaurant accounts. And he had brought the wrong beer. And so that was five or six phone calls this way, that way, the other way to figure that out um, to make sure that puzzle was uh, put back in place so to speak but um, so there's always something new and interesting yeah. happening and it's almost fortunately it's almost never the beer the beer just, is just you know you taste it every day and yeah. <laughs> yeah, the yeast does all the work there so that's <laughs> that's handy right, so but so um, yeah as I say it sounds like from what you mentioned a lot of your challenge actually exterior to Pig Pounder itself and have more to do with the rest of the businesses that are attached to it in different ways. Certainly sometimes yes absolutely or um, or training is another big one mm -hmm. and then that that primarily is going to be the bartending staff mm -hmm. and working with them to make sure because not everybody gets to be a beer nerd. Um, a lot of times what makes a good bartender is somebody who's not a beer nerd. So. I don't want to name names, but we probably have one beer nerd bartender, and then we have three really good bartenders who are excited about beer. And if you're excited about beer, uh, that is very infectious, and so they um, pick up on it as well. But training out how beer is different than other things in the bartending world, and how to present, and what little details here and there, and everywhere are important or not important um, is pretty much ongoing as well. Um, so that's always a process. So what resources have you drawn on to help you grow as a brewer? Oh man, I would say primarily, primarily people. It has been 
working in different breweries with different people over the years that has really grown uh, my own ability. I really enjoy saying, because it's true, I don't have a single original idea. But I work closely with all these folks and, and learn from them and, and everybody's got different things that they can, can add to the puzzle and can add to your own personal understanding. And that's been a big experience for me is getting the opportunity to work with so many interesting and driven people in these different breweries. But also, if I'm working at Pig Pounder, um, like I know several of the brewers in town really well and to the point where we'll call each other if we need to borrow uh, some grain or some hops or something like that or talk about uh, this or that recipe or how this beer came out or how these hops are a joke and you shouldn't use them or things like this um, that is, is very uh, continuously communal. Um, and so that's something that I really appreciate about the, uh, about the business, that I have not yet met anybody in the business who's just awful. Um, everybody's great, and there's always a lot of drive to collaborate and to share experiences and, and to learn from each other. And so that's been, for me, that's been the most beneficial. So what are some examples of those collaborations you just mentioned? Well. Um, of course there's the odd emergency situation where you don't have any yeast to pitch uh, but you need to brew a beer uh, tomorrow so you run up the you run up the road to founders and pull off a brink off of one of their fermenters or saga tuck or something like that uh, i remember that happened once in my first year of brewing um, back in 2012 or Three days ago, I have to give Stephen a call because I'm short a bag of grain because I had to bump it up on another recipe. So um, I, I was short 50 pounds of two row, just base malt for a uh, golden gilt. And so, you know, I send out some text messages to folks and I happen to get a hold of Stephen at Little Brother and he's able to give me a bag and I'll be able to exchange that later when I get another shipment in. Usually you're ordering uh, around at least, for us, at least 2,000 pounds at a time. So it's a little awkward to try to get 50 pounds of something. Uh, this is a really big bag of grain to drop ship. But, so that's, uh, that's a great example. Or on the deeper level, um, also Steven at Little Brother, he was starting up his brewery um, downtown with a very small system and lots of taps, but only three fermenters. And so to tackle that problem, he set up a program to simply work with lots of breweries in the neighborhood to brew beer off-site as a collaborative um, recipe design and collaborative execution off-site with these other facilities production uh, volume so he worked with Natty Greens he worked with us he worked with a wooden robot whole bunch of folks um, and is continuing to do so and we did our first kettle soured beer the agent orange together with them um, and that was a lot of fun where he would come up here to, to the brewery we would design the recipe um, we brew it on our system he would help out uh, on the brew house so it was an easy day. Uh, <laughs> he got to shovel the mash out. Um, so that was nice. But that was quite a good experience for us as our first uh, collaborative uh, batch of beer that I have brewed here at Pig Pounder with other folks. And we're currently working on potentially others in the future. We've been preoccupied with simply filling out our tap uh, handles it was only last week that we finally had 12 of our own beers in addition to the collaboration um, on tap. And so now that we've kind of crossed that hurdle, it affords us a little bit of an opportunity to start growing the program and, and do more collaboration, uh, collaboration beers with other folks.
So where do you see the brewing industry going in the next three to five years? Um, well, kind of in two directions, but not really pulling apart, I wouldn't say. But as I might have mentioned earlier, you have through the past five, three to five years, you have scaling up of some breweries in volume. So you get um, these regional powerhouses that are producing 20, 30, 50, 100,000 barrels a year. And then you also have far more um, locally focused retail breweries that are simply structured to be a place to go to enjoy their beer and they simply don't worry about trying to sell beer in kegs to restaurants as was, I would, I might argue, the older model. So the newer model through the next three to five years is going to be more locally focused breweries. Um, so people will have more variety, not just in the beers that they drink, but also in the breweries that they go to to get the beers that they drink. Um, and I would probably argue a lot more uh, overall shift. I don't think it's going to slow down all that much away from basic domestics and towards craft. Again, in that general trend of more people are getting interested in craft beer. Um, and so you're going to see more of a shift there continuing on as well. Um, and again, I started in 2012 brewing beer, and now in 2018, I've got all these years of experience of brewing different kinds of beers in different ways. You're going to continue to see uh, a refinement of the process, and all these different craft breweries are going to be brewing better beer, more interesting beer, to a higher, to a higher level of quality um, than we've seen in the past. And again, that's simply a continuation of a trend that is already in process now. I remember back in 2012 uh, going to a beer festival and trying other people's beers and so many of them not being very good. And <laughs> that has improved so much just in, in the few years that I've been experiencing the scene. Um, I hear stories from folks from back in 2005, 2006, and it was uh, a different world of, people were still figuring out amber ale. People were still figuring out how to brew a clean blonde that didn't have a whole bunch of buttery diacetyl in it and all this sort of stuff um, where regional breweries could handle that. Small local breweries were brewing pretty funky and by accident funky stuff. Um, and, but the trend now is that you're going to get a lot more very high quality retail local breweries serving local customers to a much higher degree than they have in the past. So what would you say is Pig Pounder's signature beer? Uh, the classic beer for Pig Pounder is the Boar Brown, which has stuck around since the opening of the brewery with the English style roots in 2014. And that is your classic northern English brown ale, um, think Newcastle, but without any caramel dye. And uh, it's an excellent beer brewed with English ingredients. The only thing that's American about it is, well, aside from the brewers making it, would be the water that we use. We use the Summerfield well water off of the Haw River Basin. Um, and obviously that's going to contribute a little bit there. but. That beer is definitely the signature. You, if you ever run across Pig Pounder anywhere, that's the one you gotta try. And what is your favorite beer from a North Carolina brewery other than your own? Okay, as a brewer, that changes usually every month, if not more rapidly. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a tough question to answer, and, but I would take it as like a uh, snapshot in time. So right now, on May 25th, 2018, and it will change probably next week, because I'll find something else. That's such a big aspect of the business is trying new things. Um, so of course, being a nerd in the business, that's what I'm all about. But right now, I could not advertise enough uh, prior brewing companies, Shrimp Gosa for sure, super cool. 
you take a unique and interesting and why would anybody ever use that to make a beer ingredient um, and do it well. That's what's exceptional about it. Lots of times you get lots of breweries trying new ingredients all the time, um, but it doesn't always work. However, this is an excellent uh, example of it working and working really well uh, to the point where it could probably win some really high level awards. Um, awesome. So yeah, I would definitely say that one. So what is your favorite Pig Pounder beer? Well again, um, we'll be coming out with something else in a couple of weeks. So it's right now, uh, I'm really enjoying the Pigmosa. Okay. That's what came out last week. Um, the Pigmosa obviously is a mimosa beer. So we brew a uh, relatively conventional ale to start out that hopefully we emphasize a little bit of the fruity esters from the ale yeast to come out and the beer is very light and clean. Um, it starts out at a 4.5 alcohol or something like that. And then we mix in orange juice just like you would make a mimosa. Um, and that brings it down to about 4.1% alcohol. So it's super clean, super light, super drinkable. You can have, you don't have to worry about the alcohol content being so low. So you can have, uh, it's definitely a session beer, so to speak. You can have two or three for myself anyway, uh, without worrying about it too much. And so that's definitely been my jam awesome. lately. Awesome. Is there anything else you'd like to add? Um, not really. I would say it's been a pleasure having you guys over here. Thanks for conducting this project. I think it's really excellent that somebody's caught on to it and is recording all of these weird and crazy stories. Um, yeah, and I really appreciate you putting the effort in for it. Oh, thank you very much. Yeah.